So I think uh, I think it's we have a large enough crowd now to start. Uh, so uh, for uh, today's uh, or this month's Home Dialysis Journal Club, we have uh, one of our first years here at uh, Vanderbilt, uh, Dr. Sagar Patel. Uh, Sagar attended medical school and residency both at Medical College of Georgia. Uh, and he will be talking to us today about a very interesting paper uh, comparing straight and coiled PD catheters. Thank you, Dr. Oshaw. Um, yeah, I think I've, after 11 months, I know most of you by now. If you don't know me, I'm Sagar Patel, like Dr. Oshami said, first year fellow. Um, today, we're going to be looking at uh, an article comparing uh, the tip of a PD catheter, whether it's straight versus coiled. Um, I want to just start off the presentation by talking about the different kinds of PD catheters we have, and then I want to re uh, review some of the uh, older literature on the topic and then present this article and see how it, it differs uh, from the previous literature. So prior to 1968, we actually didn't have any specific PD catheters. It's a pretty archaic time. Um, actually, they just used literally what was in the supply closet uh, in the operating room for general surgery and urology. So we would get things like Foley catheters, mushroom tip catheters, whistle tip catheters, polyethylene tubes, um, simple soft rubber tubes, stainless steel sump drains, and uh, even glass drains uh, were used for peritoneal access. Um, and as you could probably predict that the uh, long-term outcomes were not very well uh, with using these instruments. Um, when using these other instruments, the PD process was associated with multiple complications, including pressure on the intestines from using rigid tubes, uh, you get suction up on sterile air into the peritoneal cavity, you get plugging of holes, leakage of fluid, um, and difficulty with the the tube fixating onto the abdominal wall. So in uh, 1968, Henry Tenkoff invented the Tenkoff catheter, named after himself. Uh, the design was a, a silicone rubber catheter with a polyester background cuff. The Tenkoff catheter uh, could be kept in permanently in the abdomen. Uh, this is a cartoon image of kind of how it lies within the body. So you have your external segment, then you have this tunnel segment, and this is intraperitoneal uh, different portions of the catheter. Uh, this is a picture of an actual catheter. This is your external part. Uh, this is gonna be your tunnel segment, and then this is your intraperitoneal. And you can note a little bit hard to tell that these dots here are all kind of side ports on the catheter that allow for more fluid to flow in and out. Uh, the original catheter uh, was had a similar straight appearance, uh, an intraperitoneal portion. Uh, this segment here, the uh, tunnel segment, was a more straight. And instead of two cuffs that you see here, there was only a single cuff on the original catheter. Uh, but the tank cuff catheter uh, became the gold standard. It's still very widely used uh, today. Um, unfortunately, it's not without its own complications. Uh, you can still have complications of poor dialysis flow, tissue suction um, into the catheter openings, you get pericatheter leaks and infections, whether at the exit site, tunnel, or in the uh, peritoneum. Uh, and so to try to improve on some of these outcomes, uh, different adaptations have been made to the catheter. Uh, here's just a, a few examples of some of the things they've done. So uh, this is our original straight intraperitoneal segment, and they tried using a coiled segment here, and that's the basis of our discussion today. But just to be thorough and educational, uh, we'll look at some of the other things as well, such as the type of cuff they use, whether it's a normal cuff or a disc cuff. Then there was the development of using a double cuff rather than a single cuff. And then the uh, tunnel portion of it initially was straight, and then they've also experimented with trying to use a swan neck 
in that uh, location. Um, as far as using this coiled uh, tip, what are some of the things that you feel uh, would happen using a coiled tip that would be beneficial that we should use the tip? I'll open up to the fellows here in the audience. Maybe it's less likely to get hung up on the side of tissue because it kind of coils around. Yeah, exactly. That's that was one of the thinkings that they the reason why they they tried to use the coil tip. Um, it was assumed that the de design of the coil part gives a more bulk to the tubing that allows better separation, like uh, Jefferson said, between the parietal and visceral layers of the peritoneum. Uh, it was also thought they'd have better flow in and out of the catheter due to it's got increased length because it's coiled and you have a greater number of side holes. Um, they also thought it would have less inflow pain due to the better flow. Um, they thought there'd be less migration, less elemental wrapping, and less trauma to the viscera uh, than what you get from a straight catheter. Um, this all sounds good in theory, um, but we do need to look at the literature to see test it out. Is this actually uh, helping like we think it is? So brings us to the first uh, paper I want to talk about a little bit, uh, comparison of straight curled Tenkoff peritoneal catheter implants uh, in using percutaneous technique, pro prospective randomized study. Um, this is an older study back from 1995. Um, Unfortunately, this was published in 1995 in the Peritoneal Dialysis International Journal, which we don't have access to as Vanderbilt Fellows. It's not part of our uh, free journal description service through Vanderbilt. Uh, so I only have the abstracts. I don't have the, all the uh, raw data to go through. But essentially, this was a single study, single center study uh, done at a university hospital in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, it was a prospective randomized trial uh, involving 72 patients that were randomized to either get a straight or a coiled catheter. Um, they used, whether they were straight or coiled, all of these were single cuffed catheters and they were implanted using a percutaneous technique. Uh, the difference in catheter survival, um, you can see 77% uh, survival in the coiled group versus 36% straight group. Uh, with a p-value less than 0 0.01, so statistically significant. Um, they speculated that uh, the reason for the difference in catheter survival was due to significantly higher incidence of drainage failure associated with the catheter tip migration in the straight catheter group uh, than compared to the coil group. Um, this is just one of the early studies. Other people were also trying to in on this and see uh, was there a benefit or not. Many of the other studies were inconclusive, showing that there was no statistical difference. And uh, a few studies even showed the opposite, that the straight catheter was superior. All of these studies, though, that were limited by their sample size. So really, we needed a bigger study. And that's uh, the next paper I was going to talk about. Um, this is a coiled versus straight peritoneal dialysis catheters, randomized controlled trial, and a meta-analysis. This was a study that was published in AJKD 2011. It's a study out of China where they performed their own randomized controlled trial, a larger study, and then they incorporated that data into a meta-analysis with all the other studies to kind of get a little bit more uh, power into the study to see uh, truly what the effects were. Um, as far as the study, they used uh, a total of 80 patients uh, who were starting on continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis anywhere from October 2006 to February 2008. It was a single center study. Patients were randomized where 40 in the uh, coiled group and 40 in the straight group. Uh, the outcomes that they looked for in the study, the primary outcome was for uh, catheter tip migration with dysfunction. This was defined as a catheter tip located above the pelvic rim on a dominal radiograph, and also with an association of catheter dysfunction, uh, whether it be the inability uh, to, to drain effluents reliably within 40 minutes. 
uh, the abdominal radiographs were obtained for all patients with catheter dysfunction to diagnose whether or not they have tip migration as the, the cause. Uh, irreversible migration, uh, they defined as uh, catheter tip migration with dysfunction that failed to respond to conservative measures, such as using laxatives, ambulation, moving around, and doing clock dissolution with urokinase. Um, surgical intervention, um, whether the catheter had to be repositioned surgically or removed, uh, was performed in patients that had irreversible catheter tip migration with dysfunction. The secondary outcomes that they looked for um, were all-cause catheter failure, um, defined as a necessity to remove or reposition the catheter by surgical methods, um, not necessarily though due to tip migration. Um, Catheter-related infections, whether peritonitis or exit side infection or tunnel infection, um, and then also technique survival, um, defined as the time to transition to permanent hemodialysis therapy, essentially failure of therapy, uh, PD technique um, is what they're saying. And then overall patient survival. Uh, okay, I think how this is. Are y'all able to see the top or is that? I just, I'll read it out. Um, so, these are some of the results. Uh, looking at catheter tip migration with dysfunction, primary outcome, they noticed uh, in 18 patients or 45% of the coiled group. This was compared to nine patients or 22.5% in the straight group. Um, P value of 0 0.09, not quite statistically significant. But when they stratified uh, whether this migration and dysfunction happened less than eight weeks versus after eight weeks, um, the later than eight weeks, there was a statistically significant difference, p-value 0 0.005, 32.5% uh, occurrence in the coiled group compared to 5% in the straight group. Uh, and similarly, the irreversible cast tip migration with dysfunction, um, right here, 12.5% in the coiled group compared to none in the uh, straight group was another statistically significant finding of the study. Everything else they looked at, including uh, mechanical complications, such as uh, leakage, catheter-related infections, uh, like we said, peritonitis versus tunnel versus exit site, um, patient death and technique failure, all of these things, there you did not see any statistical uh, significance in the difference between the coiled group versus the straight group. Uh, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve, uh, again, kind of showing the same data. Uh, biggest thing to note here is initially there is not much separation. And then, like we said, after that eight weeks is when we start to do see a, a good separation between the straight group and the coil group. Um, so the next part of that study was to take that data and incorporate it into meta-analysis um, using eight studies uh, with four, a total of 493 patients. Uh, of these patients, 242 were in the coiled uh, group and 251 were in the straight end group. Um, the studies ranged wide, wide range of uh, the size, anywhere from 24 to 132 participants. Um, of the eight trials, six provided data specifically for uh, catheter failure rates or provided a data for uh, catheter tip migration with catheter dysfunction, four looked at all-cause mortality, six of these looked at uh, technique failure, and uh, seven looked at incidents of peritonitis. Uh, six examined uh, the occurrence of tunnel or exit side infection rates. The quality of each of these studies were variable, and then also of note, you know, what we were wanting to compare is coiled versus straight, but uh, we do see differences uh, mainly in this uh, same Nielsen group. This is that first paper we talked about, the Nielsen papers. Uh, they use single cough, whereas all these other ones use double cough. And then some of these uh, studies use swan neck for the uh, tunnel uh, portion of the catheter versus uh, other ones use traditional straight tongue cough uh, catheter. Uh, and then also you see the insertion method. Uh, whether it was an open surgical method or percutaneous, which you saw in the Neosync group, were all kind of differences to be aware of when trying cross-comparing some of these studies. Uh, 
Uh, so, regards to the results, uh, four studies looked at catheter tip migration with dysfunction. Um, and this uh, forest plot, we can see here the diamond represents kind of cumulative of uh, results of these four studies. And we can see that this was statistically significant. Um, it's cut off at the bottom, but the right side of the line favors uh, <laughs> catheter, and the left side favors coil capture. So we do see that um, there is a statistic statistically significant benefit of the straight catheters when it comes to catheter tip migration with dysfunction. Um, other things that were looked at were catheter failure. Um, this was defined uh, as catheter failure uh, <laughs> removal um, for any reason other than kidney transplant or death. death. Um, of the eight studies analyzed, only six reported catheter failure in accordance to this particular definition. And one of these studies was the Nielsen study, uh, which had very poor outcomes with straight catheters. Uh, but the, this paper, they attributed that to using a different technique, the percutaneous insertion method, as opposed to all the other studies uh, using um, open surgical technique. So therefore, they excluded it from their primary analysis. Um, here we can see that there is this diamond over here. Uh, it is statistically significant uh, benefit uh, for the uh, straight catheter group. Um, however, when they did uh, account for the Nielsen group, they lost that statistically significant. Uh, you can see this barely crosses over the line here. Uh, so it did lose that significance when the Nielsen study was incorporated into the data. Um, the other outcomes they looked at, uh, technique failure, uh, very possibly mildly skewing towards uh, straight cat favoring the straight catheter, but uh, not statistically significant. And death, it looks like right down the middle, if there was no statistically significance in death, um, whether they got spoiled or straight catheter. Sagar, can I interrupt for a moment? Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm grateful. And I make this comment knowing that I, there are colleagues on this Zoom that know much more than I do about this topic, um, specifically how the catheter is placed. Um, this paper doesn't present information about advanced laparoscopic techniques. I don't think it does, um, such as um, uh, omentopexy would be the major one that I would think of, but also adhesion lysing, visualization of the catheter, and fixing a hernia at the time of implantation. And so what I'm trying to walk back in my mind is when those advanced laparoscopic techniques, which do seem to have a benefit in terms of outcomes, um, became prevalent. And I think um, one of the first studies that I look at is Crabtree from 2005. But it seems that there may be some noise from, um, number one, it may make this data less generalizable to the era now where advanced laparoscopic techniques may be more prevalent. Um, but number two, um, in this study, some of, the, some of these are from 1990. You know, I wonder if the 2010 were folks doing advanced laparoscopic techniques there. Um, it sounds like nobody was in any of these studies, so perhaps it's less of an issue, but it's just, it's a potential source of um, not being able to generalize to today and perhaps noise in, um, in this data. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, technology and techniques have changed uh, definitely since the 90s. And uh, also, you know, like we mentioned earlier, with the differences in the studies, whether the number of cuffs they use, the type of cuff, um, the tunnel segment, whether straight or, or uh, swan neck, these are all other variables to consider that kind of we lose some of the, um, it's not as straightforward that it's, it's we're comparing portal versus straight. But not to take away from the study, Sagar, not to take away from the study at all. I think it's wonderful that these folks were thinking about it and generalizing and trying to aggregate data. So, you know, this is one of this is where we started. So this is good that you're presenting it. 
that this is a good effort. Um, so all that taken into account, um, there still was not a general consensus, you know, is, is the straight catheter tip better? Um, is there no significance? Um, so still needed to do larger or review more, more studies. Um, this next paper I talk about, uh, it was a systemic review and meta-analysis kind of comparing uh, not just the peritoneal dialysis uh, tip type, but just a lot of the other aspects of the catheter, um, like the uh, top of the uh, tunnel portion and, and the cuffs. Um, this paper uh, was published in 2014. It looked at uh, 13 different studies that compared straight wrist coil, swan neck versus uh, tank cuff. Um, neck and single versus double cuff. Um, so again, like Dr. Purcell was pointing out, there's a lot of different variables here. And so this paper looked at kind of look at individually each thing, but uh, for our purposes, I just wanted to talk about their findings in the straight versus coiled groups. Um, so here are the, the results of their studies. Um, again, the right side favors uh, the straight group and the left side favors um, the coiled group. Um, so with regards to straight risk coiled, six studies, um, including 454 patients, looked at exit site infection rate. There was no statistically significant difference here. Uh, those same studies also looked at peritonitis, for which there was no significant difference. Um, seven studies with 433 patients looked at migration. Um, they did not notice any difference, uh, but I do want to point out it does, you know, seem like some of these a lot of these studies are favoring the straight, and then this outlier here is that same Nielsen group from 1995, that first case that we talked about, that favored the coiled group. Um, when it comes to leakage, and uh, there was no statistical, statistical dip, significance, and then removal, again, a lot of these studies kind of skewing towards uh, the straight side, but uh, the same Nielsen group favoring coiled and overall no real significance. Um, and just looking uh, at just a few other aspects that they studied were wound infection, drainage dysfunction, uh, and referral of surgical um, interventions, no significance um, in the studies that they compared here. Is there any reason a priori to think that there'd be a difference in uh, exit site infection or wound infection between the two catheters? Um, it's hard to say, but you know, the, the type of part inside the peritoneum you would think would not play a role in the exit site. That you'd be thinking more of, you know, the type number of cuffs you have and whether you had a straight versus a swan neck um, tunnel portion. How about a downgoing exit site? Yeah, so the, the downgoing exit site uh, was related with the, the swan neck. That's why it's, it's curving down. Um, and then the last thing I looked at was survival um, of the catheter at one year and two years. At one year, they did not notice any statistical difference. Um, and sorry, this is actually a little bit confusing because now for some reason in this picture, they flipped the favoring straight is on the left side and favoring coiled is on the right side. Um, so while some of these favor the straight, that Nielsen group favoring coiled makes this just uh, not significant, but that Nielsen group was only went out to 12 months of their study. So when they looked at two-year survival, which did not include that group, there was a statistical um, significant to better outcome in the straight group. Um, Still, even with this meta-analysis, the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis does not have a consensus for a preferred catheter type. Um, so still not enough data out there. And that's what led um, our investigators in the topic of our general club to uh, perform their study. So this is the article that I want to discuss today, looking at straight versus coiled peritoneal dialysis catheters, randomized control trial, 
by uh, Chow et al. Uh, this was published in the AJKD in 2020. Uh, this was a prospective open label randomized controlled trial. It was a multi center study at two different dialysis centers in Hong Kong, um, Prince of Wales Hospital and Alice Ho Yu Ming uh, Nethersole Hospital. Uh, in the study, 300 eight eligible patients were randomly assigned uh, to straight versus coiled. The primary outcome uh, measure of the study was the incidence of catheter dysfunction that requires surgical intervention. Um, catheter dysfunction was referred to as a drain failure um, with the inability to drain peritoneal dialysis uh, reliably within 45 minutes. And intervention includes catheter repositioning or reinsertion um, either by open surgical method or laparoscopy. Um, temporary catheter dysfunction that resolved with treatments, uh, conservative treatments like laxative, fibrinolytic therapy were not uh, counted as an event in the analysis, only the ones that required surgical intervention. Um, secondary endpoints that they looked at included the catheter dysfunction, time to this uh, catheter dysfunction required intervention, infusion pain, risk of peritonitis, uh, technique failure and peritoneal catheter survival. Uh, infusion pain was measured with the use of visual analog scale that ranged from zero to 10. And the study participants were questioned on infusion pain around one month after starting PE. Um, so the patient population in this group, uh, patient inclusion criteria, the patient had to be 18 years or older um, it required an insertion of a 10 cot catheter for long term PD. Exclusion criteria included any known contraindications to PD or participation in any other interventional study within the last 30 days of randomization. Patients requiring a reinsertion of catheters were allowed, and recruitment took place from June 2015 to March 2017 at the two study centers. Patients went, uh, underwent randomization and were assigned almost at a one-to-one -one ratio to either the straight or quote PD catheters. Uh, it was actually 153 to 155. And uh, the treatment allocation was not blinded to the investigators. Um, so people put in the catheters, they knew what kind of catheter they were put in. All the catheter used were double cuff and had a straight intercuff segment. Uh, the Lengths of the straight and coiled catheters were 45 centimeters and 62 centimeters, respectively. Uh, they were inserted by a nephrologist using an open dissection, open dissection surgical technique. Uh, the same 10 primary operators uh, who had qualified as nephrologist specialists were the ones responsible for putting in all these catheters. So they tried to limit who was putting in these catheters. And each of these nephrologists had experience of inserting at least a catheter. So well, well experienced and well controlled. Uh, patients with extreme obesity, patients requiring laparoscopic uh, ad adhesion elysis um, or rectus sheath tunneling or omentopexy were not recruited in the study. So I think that kind of points out it's something that Dr. Purcell was um, hinting towards. Um, and these other techniques that can be used uh, on place in MPD catheter. So we kind of took those higher risk patients out. So we're only looking at one particular technique. Uh, the peritoneal dialysis was delayed until three weeks, at least three weeks after insertion to allow time for healing. Um, in the straight catheter group, there were two surgical complications uh, and these patients were had to be removed um, during the placement of the catheter. Um, it, it intermittently hit the urinary or bladder and one went to the pre peritoneal space. So ended up being 151 in the straight group and 155 in the coiled group. Uh, this is just showing the uh, patient demographics. Uh, average age around 61 uh, was predominantly male study, about 60 to 70% uh, males uh, compared to females. Um, of note, the BMI uh, on the high end of normal, around 25 of these patients, uh, an equal mix of diabetic patients, patients with coronary disease. Um, oddly, uh, patients using automated peritoneal dialysis, even though there was no statistical difference, there did tend to be a little bit more 
in the coiled group. Um, as far as the results, um, for the straight catheter, there was only one uh, patient that met the primary endpoint compared to nine in the coiled group. So uh, absolute risk reduction of 5.1%, that was statistically significant. Um, and the hazard ratio of the coiled compared to straight was at 8.69. Um, something to note here is this, the, in general, the low rate of the primary endpoints um, total of 3.3%, whereas in those other studies, we were seeing dysfunction uh, at a rate of 15 to 35%. And again, using that same definition of tip migration with catheter dysfunction requiring surgical intervention. So we're looking at the same outcome, and yet um, even though the coiled catheter was worse, total, everybody did better than the other studies. And, you know, whether that can be from better, you know, like we mentioned, better technique nowadays, 2020, compared to what people were doing in the 1990s. Um, also, the study was done in Hong Kong, where peritoneal dialysis is the first choice. So there's a, a larger number of patients. People are better trained uh, in this uh, because of how many patients they have. And then because of there's so many patients, we have dedicated teams in Hong Kong. This is, this is all they do. This is not like... Uh, you know, someone going, doing a cholecystectomy and then going and playing the peritoneal dialysis catheter. These people are focusing only on putting catheters. Um, here's the Kaplan-Meier curve comparing the data. Um, one of the secondary endpoints they were looking at was the time to dysfunction, and there was a median uh, time of 7.5 months um, to um, dysfunction. But again, straight catheter is favored over the coiled. Um, some of the other secondary outcomes, uh, the occurrence of uh, peritonitis, um, there was no statistical difference. And also in catheter survival, there was no statistical difference. Um, the last secondary outcome that they looked at was for infusion pain. Um, so you can see here the median uh, score was zero in the straight group uh, compared to one in the coiled group. And there was a statistical significance, at least by the uh, statistical method. Um, however, on a pain of zero to a pain of one um, on a scale of 10, is that for the patient much different? It's hard to tell. Um, and also of note, uh, three quarters of the participants uh, had a score of zero or one. So most of these patients didn't have pain. So it's hard to really uh, make a judgment off of that. Um, this was infusion pain. They didn't include drain pain uh, because they thought that that was more related, uh, not to the tip type, but, all, but rather the insertion side of the catheter lane. Um, so I'm going to open up to the fellows in the room. What were some of the strengths and weaknesses you, you think about in this study? Can I, ask? Um, I was wondering if we go back to table one. It looked to me like the patients who got straight catheters had much more abdominal surgeries versus coiled catheter group. Uh, just table one. So maybe the actual effect is underestimated because it seems that the straight catheter group has been undergoing more abdominal surgeries. The straight catheter groups on the left, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, I might mean, guess like if you had more surgeries, you'd be more likely to have treatment failure because you have adhesions and other things. So that almost like yeah, that's the point. I'm thinking the effect is underestimated. Oh, okay. You're thinking there's a stronger benefit for straight catheters because yeah. they put them in more high, high, higher risk patients, so it has better outcomes. Or like nephrectomies, it was like what you would hear. So, the, if, sorry for the fellows. If we're going to be discussing what we perceive to be the significance of surgical procedures where the p value is 0 0.4. 
I think you're opening a can of worms because there are variables that you're not discussing where the p-value was 0.2. And so where do you draw the line, right? So just because we look at the numbers and we think that it's significant doesn't always mean that it's significant because I mean, by comparison, if you look at BMI, right? Like, or like the body weight, right? The P is 0.2. So would you argue that the straight catheter group right, had the, a much thinner patients than the coiled catheter group. I would just be cautious um, when making comments like that about what our perceptions, unless you have specific procedures that you want to look at, such as in a frectomy, for example. One would suspect that there would be a statistical difference if you looked at nephrectomies between the two groups, right, and what we perceive would be the effect of a nephrectomy on exchanges. Just I'm going to jump in if it's okay. I, I just have one quick question. All right, so it's really more of a comment. There were 10 different nephrologists, it looks like, putting these catheters in at two different centers with 300 and some patients. I couldn't see anywhere in here where they basically tried to see whether there was something related to the operator as far as why, you know, was it operator dependent or was this equally divided amongst all the uh, operators? In other words, was one operator less talented than the others and that's the one that had the nine catheters that had to be, uh, you know, uh, removed and reinserted. Uh, I, I couldn't see, at least in the manuscript itself, where they, where they tried to assess that one way or another. Was there anything, any supplemental material or? That's definitely a good point. I, I did not find anything about uh, looking at specifically which uh, proceduralists put the catheter in to see what their particular outcomes were. I completely agree with uh, Dr. Corbett that operator uh, dependent um, success or effects, I did not see that that was mentioned. I was also to expand on that curious about um, the criteria for um, patients expected to require uh, laparoscopic adhesiolysis, um, rectus sheath tunneling and omentopexy were not recruited in the study. And, and so I didn't see um, you know, different operators might have a different opinion about who might need an advanced laparoscopic technique, who might need to have an omentopexy. Um, and we don't know, we don't have the data. Um, so just to expand on what Dr. Corbett was saying. Uh, this is Tushar from Toronto. Uh, I, I, the, the comment about the 0.4, the p-value, um, I just want to go back, like, if it is a randomized control trial, the p-value has no value in that first uh, uh, in the first table, okay? There are many uh, factors which are balanced. We assume that they are well balanced and that P-value should not make a decision for us at all. So that's just a one or two cent thing for the fellows. Yeah, Tushar, I completely uh, agree with you. This is Rachel at Vanderbilt. And I would um, just take that a step further and say that um, <clears throat> I'm not even sure a Kaplan-Meier analysis would be, um, I think that we're entering this era where we need to take into account the potential for competing risks and the traditional statistical analyses of, my understanding currently is that the traditional statistical analysis, statistical analyses of Kaplan-Meier and survival curves actually overestimate your risk of the event at risk. And, um, and I, don't see, I don't see confidence intervals either. Um, so I, I have some questions about the statistics um, that I would have to think about more closely. I'm not sure this is the right test statistic for this analysis, for this trial. Before we go uh, too much further, uh, first of all, I think this discussion is good. We have representation here from a lot of uh, institutions outside of Vanderbilt. I'd like to get at least uh, from them what catheter, what catheter type they're using. It could be uh, straight, could be coiled, could be mixed. Uh, but I'd like to at least hear from those outside people. And we'll, let's start on the East Coast and let's go, uh, we'll go to uh, a, a New York and we've got two people in New York. We've got Steve and uh, Jaime. You guys wanna pipe in and then we'll go to Canada and um, Chicago, please. To me, it's very easy. It is always a it is always coil, and now I see that I'm doing the wrong thing. The wrong thing, <laughs> apparently, but it's hundred percent coil. I'm not pushing for it. I'm just describing what has been happening over the past 
30 years or so, always coil. Steve Fishbane, are you still with us? Yeah, hey, Tom. Uh, so we have Mala Such Deva from my group. So we use coil, but I'll turn it over to her if she's um, able to. Hi, how are you? Uh, yeah, we use coiled catheters as well. I don't think we even have access to straight catheters right now. Uh, our Toronto people. Um, I'll, I must say that this gives me a little pause for thought. Uh, we also use coiled catheters and I'm really happy with them. Uh, in the very nice literature review that you did before you came to the paper we discussed, there really did seem to be a, a signal outside of that one from Nielsen. There was a signal for better results with the straight catheters, although I don't really understand why. And I don't like, in my experience, if you get through the first few months of the catheter, you're basically away to the races. And I don't understand in the uh, meta-analysis why there was worse outcome for the coiled catheters in the second year. Um, Cause that just isn't my experience. So if you're gonna run into trouble, it's really in the, in the weeks to months after you put in the catheter, not in the second year. So I'm a little bit uh, surprised at that, but you know, it, 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 we like we we're sold on coiled catheters, but this does give me a little pause for thought, taking into account all the things that you brought up about uh, operator dependence and things like that. I like the word flamoxed. Uh, uh, the word, I think we're flamoxed. You like that word, Joanne? Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, Chicago. We uh, Chicago folks. So we use, you know, for forty years. We pretty much had the same surgeon putting most of these in surgically. And he used a, a double cuff tank off straight catheter all those time, all those years. And it, it seemed to work quite well. And in the more recent past, the interventional nephrologists or interventional radiologists are putting them in and they put in the, they put in coiled catheters. So it's interesting. The surgeons still use a double cuff straight, but the uh, interventional radiologists, when they put them in, and more of my colleagues have been having them put them in as opposed to the surgeons, I still actually like the surgeons to put them in. Uh, but they use the pigtail. Have you noticed any difference since uh, IR started doing it as well? You know, the only problem, the only time there was a difference was in a kind of a, a couple patients where they're a little more complicated, where they must have had more momentum when they put them in, they weren't working as well. So when I, after the second catheter that didn't work, we had the surgeons put it in, and they were able to, you know, more directly dissect down and get the uh, catheter in the gutter, and it worked beautifully. But uh, Beyond that, no, we, had, we haven't, at least in, in my experience, haven't noticed a big difference between the coil or the straight. Uh, Eric, are you with us from UAB? And uh, yeah. the significance of Eric is he was involved with Rachel uh, Fassell with that, uh, uh, the catheter study out of the North American chapter. Yeah, we, we use exclusively coil tip, which, you know, one, one question is, I wonder, because our radiologists, I mean, it took me about two to three years to get our radiologists to actually read our, our x-rays appropriately, because, you know, our, we get these results that said, um, you know, PD catheter in abdomen, and the residents would look at it and say, oh, it's normal. And then every time I had a, a catheter malfunction, I'd go back and look at it myself and say, how many x-rays did we have where this was abnormal, right? And so I just wonder if... Now, the identification of the coil is so much easier, at least for me, on looking at x-rays. And I wonder how much of this is just observation bias because, you know, you have this big coil and it's up in the mid, the mid section of the abdomen. So people actually take a look at it as opposed to, you know, the straights, which are a little bit harder to identify. So, so I don't know. I, I, I like the coil. It's just easy for me to see. Um, but, but, you know, that's all we've, we've ever used here is the coil. Glad you mentioned that, Eric. That thought was actually in my mind about visualizing it, and I don't know if it's uh, you know, especially you know, uh, people like you know, uh, Dr. Corbe, who has both seen patients with both. Is one easier to visualize than the other? I mean, you know, to see the coil, obviously, you've got more of that radio uh, labeled strip that you can see coiled on itself, but. You know, I, I've never really found a problem in general, unless the patient has a lot of stool or something, uh, being able to trace the uh, straight cath. I mean, it has the same, it has, I think there's two uh, radio opaque strips that go along and kind of parallel with each other. 
I think once you start tracking it, you can pretty much see where it's going, whether it's in the gutter or it's flipped up under the liver, depending upon which side they put it on. Uh, I, I've never really noticed a problem with that, but I agree. I don't think the radiologists in general, because it's not the interventional people that are looking at it. They're the ones that usually put it in. It, when you send them over to get a KUB, it's just the general radiologists and they exactly, they, they don't really have much of a sense of where they're, what they're looking at anyway. They just say it's in the abdomen. So I think most of us here, when we send someone over, uh, my colleague, Dr. Rodby and I are the primary people taking care of the PD patients. When we send somebody over to get a KUB, we'll look at it ourselves and try and make a judgment on it. No, I, I think that's key uh, is, is looking at yourself. I guess the question would be is if you had a savvy radiologist, just a little bit savvy, would they identify it if they were getting an x-ray for some other completely different reason? Right, a chest X-ray and it's it's up here, or a KUB for you know something different, and so then it'd be an inadvertent. Um, you're not looking at a catheter, but but I don't know. Did did every uh, institution? Uh, if I miss somebody, I would, would like to get their opinion. Any institutions outside of Vanderbilt that have not spoken up? What about Vanderbilt? Is it coil or straight? Oh God, let me uh, so. Uh, after some of these papers uh, advocated straight, I went to straight. Oh, well, no. well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, my colleagues and the surgeons tried to castrate me because of that decision. And we went back to coiled about two or three years ago. And now I can speak with a full voice. Uh, so the, uh, my folks spoke with uh, great enthusiasm. They rejected the straights. We did the straights for about I'm gonna guess about a year, maybe a year and a half. So we're back to coiled, coiled swan neck, two cuff catheters. Why'd you go back to coiled? He was intimidated. <laughs> yes, I was, was, I was more than, I was threatened. Dr. I was Culver threatened. intimidated? I was threatened folks. Uh, and Rachel can speak up, Julie Lewis can speak up, the rest of my colleagues here can speak up and the surgeons as well. They. Uh, it looked like there might be a little bit more uh, 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 complication migration, but uh, you know when, we, we were putting in about 12 a year, so we're not talking about a, anything statistical. Uh, uh, so, but it, they spoke vehemently to go back to the coil. But Tom, this is a real problem because we do coil, coil, coil forever but the problem is that this evidence says straight straight so am i with what face do i look at the resident the students and the new fellows and say it is coiled i mean am i lying constantly i have a real ethical problems here it is so many he did a background your fellow it is not only this paper but it's a whole background and he shows that a straight is the way to go and however i do coil I mean, I'm ready for my practice there. Well, one thing I would like to point out is uh, some of the, I guess, limitations in the study as far as generalizability. Um, this paper was done uh, in um, Hong Kong. And the meta-analysis, you look at where everything was done primarily in Asian and European countries. I think there's one US study on here, but uh, you know, just the, the, the patient type, um, whether there is a genetic difference between Asians and, and Americans or the body habitus as well. There's definitely, you know, our typical US Western patient compared to an Eastern patient that may also play, play a difference. The average BMI in this study was uh, 25, um, <laughs> you know, high side of normal, but I think that's definitely something to take into consideration that does this study apply to us? And that's actually, um, two of the things that kind of follow up studies that I would like to see is one similar large study like this one but done with the U.S. population. And then one other comment I had was... Uh, oh. So, Sagar, that, uh, uh, Rachel and Eric uh, did that. Why don't you guys tell us the results of that? The, the North American chapter study, which was Canadian and American. Well, um, I don't know that I can quote that data. Um, I can tell you that in the first paper that we were involved with, um, the majority of, uh, of sites um, used 83%, so I'm looking at this now, 83% um, had more than one uh, insertion technique, 
And 71% in our initial uh, paper that Eric and I worked on, um, thank you to colleagues uh, in Canada um, who, um, who involved us in this, um, in this study, um, uh, Matt Oliver and Rob Quinn, grateful to be involved. Um, I uh, used advanced laparoscopic techniques, and that is my major problem, as I put in the chat, with generalizability. And I think that it's very hard to isolate the signal that is coming from the type of catheter without um, taking into account um, the operator effects, as Dr. Corbett mentioned previously, because I think that that is something that we, we still don't have a really good handle on, and it, it's it is important. There's variation in uh, surgical outcomes by volume and by operator, and it's it's hard to measure that. And then number two, uh, particularly the more recent um, observational data on um, on just tacking the omentum out of the way, not the small omentums, but the big omentums. Patients really tend to do better if the surgeon puts in a laparoscope and just tacks it up there by the liver. Uh, they they have less um, involvement of um, you know the omentum wrapping around the catheter later on, and so I think that it's it's very challenging to general. I just I don't have enough signal unless those two sources for me of noise um, are removed. I think and, that uh, being, oh, I, I think that, oh, oh, sorry, I, was, oh, I just want, yeah. I want Dr. Irovari to feel better. I just want to. Well, I mean, I mean, yeah, so I, that, I want to give me some. Give me some numbers. Yeah, I mean. So can I make a quick comment? I mean, this is really a common problem in particularly new medical devices um, that require a surgical or a surgical technique, whether it be done by a nephrologist or a surgeon. And that is the skill set of the person performing the technique. Um, and so if there was a difference in those nephrol 10 nephrologists and who did straight or who did coiled, um, you know, that in and of itself would introduce a variable. And there's certainly examples, like if we remember the renal artery stenosis and Dick Dean and those guys in his hands, repairing renal artery stenosis was fabulous. But in the general, more general population, when larger studies were done, it wasn't reproducible. And I think this is a dilemma with all intervention um, studies. Um, and probably the safest way to do it is to, um, and I guess, Tom, your experience could be an example of that. I mean, it may be that even with the same surgeons, our surgeons are better at putting in coil than straight. And somewhere else, the surgeon might, for whatever reason, be better at straight than coil. It sort of, it even applies to the GME right now, right? I mean, there are good and bad surgeons. And like, how are you, how is that being, um, evaluated? How is that being addressed? I mean, it's a very, it's a lot, a lot more complicated than doing a give someone a pill and give someone a placebo um, study. So I, I think, I mean, the, the point is well taken. And I think we're always, we'll always say something along the lines of, oh, well, this study's findings are this, but we have a much better surgeon over here who's going to be more proficient at it. But I do also understand Dr. Urbari's Point with the exception of the Nielsen study from 1995, which precedes right most of the advanced laparoscopic interventions, right that, Ray, that Dr. Vassell right has outlined. Um, they they're either findings for the most part that Sager showed are either equivocal or they're leaning more towards you know the straight okay. catheter with overlap down the middle. Okay. So there isn't really too much in the literature. Um, that is supportive of um, coiled catheters being the standard, which I think is the point that you're trying to make, Dr. Yu, am I correct? I mean, the point that I'm trying to make is that I put only coiled catheters and the yeah. evidence is all for a straight and whatever the other doctors who might respect the law, they're just talking. They're saying things like, yeah, when there is a sun out, this is hotter. When the clouds are in, are cold. They're yeah, sure. The surgeon play, plays a role. This plays a role. The body plays a role. The fact is that straight is better than coil in this particular case. And so why do we keep putting the coil? What defense do oh. I have? Just give me one. 
Just one. I have another question for you, Dr. Urbari. Um, how good do you want your outcomes to be? Because if you're happy with your outcomes, like our outcome, we do all coiled. That is what we do. 63 centimeter double cuffed. And we have really good outcomes. I know that because I'm tracking them. And so uh, if, if, if my surgeons are happy and we're, we're keeping people on PD and getting them transplanted, you know, why, you know, if you're happy with your outcomes, why would you want you know, our numbers are as good or better than in all of these studies. Um, so, so that's, that's one, you know, answer for your uh, potential critics is that you're actually doing pretty well compared to the literature. And then the question of coiled versus straight. Well, I think that there's just a lot of other variables that we've talked about the operator um, that these studies don't take into account, partly because they're a different popul. Many of them are in Asia, which is in a different different population for cultural, there are some cultural reasons that could, I think, affect um, the results. But we're getting these good outcomes in folks who have a high BMI with a lot of diabetes and hypertension and cardiovascular disease with the comorbid characteristics with the thumb on the scale that should lead to worse outcomes. Um, I'm going to need um, you know, my answer would be I'm, I would like to be open minded, I would like to see the objective data in a similar population with, as Julia said, and uh, Dr. Corbett said, some of these operator variables controlled for um, with a, a, a better statistical analysis that would make me consider changing. Why rock the boat? We're doing well with what, you know, our numbers are good. Um, and so, so there's nothing even pushing me to want to do a randomized control trial, to be honest, of straight versus coiled. Um, I'm very curious to hear what others <laughs> what others think of that. <laughs> no, I agree with you. I mean, I, I I now feel you know better after reading this paper, knowing we've been doing it the right way all these forty years. But uh, <laughs> but I mean, we've been talking about this for almost forty years plus. I know I know Joanne remembers these discussions well. I mean, all the various permutations of the catheter, single cuff, double cuff, swan neck. I was kind of more interested. We weren't talking about swan neck versus uh, you know straight catheter when I saw that they put these straight catheters in, whether they be pigtail or, or not, and they were, and they try to direct the exit site down. I mean, for any of us that, you know, or for all of us that look at this, you know, they can try all they want, but the, these catheters, these, you know, these, these silicon catheters have memory and it's hard to bend the catheter. And I don't care how you tack it down coming out of the exit. The next thing you know, it's kind of pointing upwards anyway. And the question of whether or not, you know, with the exit site pointing to the side, which maybe you'll get most of the time, but ultimately pointing upwards versus a swan neck, whether that decreases, you know, whether the swan neck would decrease your rate of exit site infections, which was really the bigger issue from my perspective, historically. Um, and so I agree with all the comments, you know, if it's been working for you, uh, this is not about practice issue. I mean, no one is, can agree on which of these catheters is better than the other, as far as I'm aware. I mean, the only one that I found that was probably a dif difficult, and I don't even know if people talk about it anymore, was the disc catheter. Uh, you know, I had the disc at the end, and the problem with that is get, taking it in and putting it in and taking it out. I mean, it was a bitch to get that thing out if it got infected, whereas these are a little easier, whether they be pigtail or not, to get them out is a little easier one way or the other because they'll unfold as you're pulling them out or as they surgically remove them, whereas those disc catheters would get buried in there, from my understanding. Um, so it, 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 for us, I mean, like I said, the surgeon, we've had almost essentially the same surgeon for all these years has been putting the majority of them in when we do them surgically. And, you know, when these discussions came up 30 or 40 years ago, we basically let him go with what he, he liked and it's, it's, you know, it served us well. So I think, uh, uh, so we're kind of past the hour mark now, but I do have one, one last question um, for the attendings that are on the call. Um, if you have patients who experience uh, drainage issues, right, or catheter dysfunction, would you consider asking the surgeon if the catheter needs to come out to switch to the alternative? So would you, if they're coiled, would you tell them, hey, can we try doing straight if you're comfortable? Would you bring that up or would you, just whichever one they're comfortable with, we'll just try it again. 
Well, generally, it, it's a matter, and, I, and I'll shut up after this. I've talked enough, but I mean, it's, it's a matter of having them go back in and look and see what's going on. I mean, sometimes it's an issue has been discussed that they need to tack the ominum up or do something more. Uh, I give them the benefit of the doubt to go in and take a look and see what they think. And if they think that there might be an advantage to the other one, by all means, but oftentimes they can kind of figure it out, at least in our experience, what the problem is and they can correct it. I have to go. Thank you. It's a great conference. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Um, yeah, Roger, I'd be here, uh, Rush. Um, Rachel brought up the point about, uh, you know, the exclusion of patients with severe obesity or whatever. Um, and, you know, when you look at this paper, at least, the average BMI is 20. 20 yeah, 20, yeah, Pretty low. I don't think that represents U.S. PD patients at all. Um, when I look, I found what I found was um, that's not it. Uh, I'm not going to share because I don't know if I'll have that. But uh, what I found, kind of an indirect look at this, was um, when they looked at boy, sorry, when they looked at um, Prevalence of diabetes by BMI in the SHIELD trial, which was studied to help improve early evaluation management of risk factors for leading to diabetes. There's a very, just, that's not a very common BMI um, in, in, in at least this population. Um, now, this, this is from, this paper's from what, China? Yeah, Hong Kong. Yes. Hong yeah. Kong, yeah. Okay, so... I mean, maybe they're just, it's different, but I don't know. I mean, I, I think you have to take it with a grain of salt that, uh, that you know, that, because what happens with a higher BMI is there's a lot more mental, you know, there's a lot more mental fat too. And that's kind of what often gets in the way of draining. And so, I don't know. I, I it, It's a little bit apples and oranges to me. And I just want to point that out. So what I want to see is a randomized control trial of uh, folks with a range of BMI with uh, surgeons that have been doing advanced laparoscopic techniques with placement for, um, for uh, several, several years um, with, uh, who rate the size of the omentum, as I've seen some literature does, one to three, with three being largest, and perhaps you know, deciding that um, folks who have a two or a three or a large omentum that uh, those folks get a prophylactic um, um, uh, om omentopexy, where they tack it up close to the liver. And here's, I don't see any signal in the literature that that would be use, that would not be useful, okay? So there's not a lot of controversy, but here's my question. Since the omentum has an immune function, do the folks that are randomized to have some kind of you know, impairment or restriction on what the omentum does by tacking it away to the side in those folks who are larger and who have more fat, big, larger, bigger omentum, um, do they have a higher risk of uh, peritonitis because the omentum is tacked to the side and can't perform its usual immune function? And that, that's what I'm really curious about. I, the surgeons I work with here, um, two of them I've talked with in particular pretty much always do uh, a prophylactic um, uh, om omento omet omentopexy. I always get the, the two of them mixed up, but all, uh, because the words are difficult, but always prophylactically tack that omentum up to the side by the liver. Just They just do it because they're sick of going in and disentangling the omentum from the catheter and having to put in a new one. I have no RCT data to um, to support that all the all the observational data supports it but i'm curious about impairment of the immune function of the omentum is there more peritonitis if you're more if you spend more if you do more um uh omentopexies i just don't know that's a question i have i, I never thought about it so i think we're uh, eight minutes over now. I'd like to thank everyone who uh, participated in today's discussion. I think it was a lively discussion. Uh, we've, uh, you know, got through a lot, got to share experiences from different locations. Um, I'd like to thank you all and stay tuned for 
discussion of the balance trial next month. 